evening and uh, good afternoon. Uh, we welcome to Air Quality Management uh, Lecture Series. Uh, today we are having a 19th lecture by Professor uh, John Kurvila, a well-known uh, researcher in air quality management area. So this uh, lecture uh, been supported by Department of Civil Engineering, IIT Madras, and uh, GCRF Clean Environment and Planetary Health in Asia, SIPA Network. And all of you know that uh, today is an Hath Day, and uh, greetings uh, from all the environmental uh, you know, scientists and engineers on this occasion. So we have a, a, a large uh, members who work associated with the SIPA network, uh, with uh, uh, you know, colleagues from uh, uh, India and also other countries. So we started this uh, uh, project uh, in uh, collaboration with uh, UKRE, uh, supported by UKRE, with uh, uh, various institutions from Asia and uh, UK. Uh, basically to understand uh, the uh, intersectorial interdisciplinary engagement and their contribution in addressing the environmental issues uh, particularly in the uh, uh, developing countries in in asia and uh, mostly uh, to see that what works in one country or a uh, one location and how do we uh, take that knowledge in order to uh, improve the environmental quality in the other place so and also uh, give uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, long cooperation, long, uh, uh, co create lasting partnership to instigate the clean environment uh, transformation in Asia. And also, we look forward to uh, joint research collaborations and other aspects uh, to student exchange and uh, you know, staff exchange or researcher exchange. So, these are all the key objectives uh, I've just indicated uh, before that. As a part of SIPA activities, uh, we have uh, initiated uh, a newsletter uh, named Prakriti, and uh, 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 quarterly we are releasing this uh, newsletter. Uh, we also uh, created a documentation on uh, solid waste management, a video which will you know useful to the children. Uh, they can understand uh, how the solid waste management can be initiated in their local community. And uh, we have initiated several panel discussion, community activities, uh, particularly uh, bring out how art can be connected to the environmental management. And uh, recently, uh, during this uh, pandemic, we happened to organize uh, you know, the International Symposium in Thailand. And thanks to our uh, international collaborator from uh, Moodle in University, uh, Professor Karichat, uh, for uh, taking all the you know, precautions and measures and uh, uh, you know, Corporations in organizing an excellent uh, symposium at uh, Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, so, air quality management lecture series we started in October 2020, and uh, basically to uh, see that this this particular uh, you know forum act as an uh, 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 some kind of an opportunities for the young researchers, scientists, and engineers and educators to explore uh, the future cooperations with uh, uh, the researchers and also. Uh, look for the recent technologies that may be available in addressing the air quality management and look for collaborations with stakeholders and also industries. So these are all some of the uh, earlier uh, keynote uh, speakers are, uh, led, uh, they are given in the air quality management lecture series. Uh, we started with uh, uh, you know our former member secretary, a well-known researcher in air quality management and uh, uh, the last one was given by Professor Akula Venkatraman from uh, you know, uh, University of California, Riverside, USA. And today we have with us uh, Professor Kurvila Jan. Uh, now I'll request uh, uh, Lakshmi Pradeep to introduce uh, Professor Kurvila Jan. Thank you, sir. Uh... Good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to Air Quality Management Lecture Series for the month of April. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker of today's lecture, Professor Kurivila John, Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of North Texas, USA. Dr. Kurivila John is a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of North Texas, Denton, Texas. He received his BTEC degree in Chemical Engineering in 1986 from Anna University, India, after which he worked briefly for Asian Paints in Madras before moving to the United States for higher education. He earned his MS and PhD degrees in Chemical Engineering from the University of Iowa in 1989 and 1996, respectively. 
He has worked as a visiting scientist at IBM's Bergen Scientific Center in Norway and as a research associate with the State University of New York at and the New York State Department of uh, Environmental Conservation. In 1995, he started his academic career with Texas A&M University, Kingsville, where he rose to be a professor of environmental engineering. He also served as the associate dean and interim dean of the Frank H. Dodger College of Engineering at Tamu. In 2009, he joined the University of North Texas and served as the associate dean of research and graduate studies for the College of Engineering until 2016. From 2016 through 2021, Professor John served as the chair for the second largest department within the College of Engineering at UNT. His research interests are in the area of environmental sustainability with a focus on air quality monitoring, modeling, and assessment. He has an active research portfolio and was instrumental in securing 43 research contracts, grants, and projects worth over $15 million from various industries and funding agencies, including National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, among others. He has served as principal investigator and project director of a National Science Foundation funded center for research excellence in science and technology. As a mentor, Professor John has supervised 57 MS students, four PhD scholars, and 13 postdoctoral researchers and scientists since 1995. With his students, Professor John has authored over 85 peer reviewed journal papers, reports, book chapters, and conference papers. He has co-edited a book titled The Changing Climate of South Texas, 1900 to 2100, Problems and Prospects, Impacts and Implications. He has contributed to the academic and research community globally by serving on multiple advisory and review boards, committees, and councils. As an air quality expert, he has spoken to various groups internationally. In 2019, he was selected for the U.S. Speaker Program Series, sponsored by the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, of the U.S. Department of State, and he visited Kuwait. Today, in his lecture, Professor Kurivila John will be talking on the topic, Modeling of Emerging and Unconventional Sources of Pollution from an Air Quality Management Perspective. He will be addressing various modeling approaches that are required at multiple scales, both temporal and spatial, to evaluate the influence and impact of such new sources of air pollution. In the first part of the talk, he will introduce dispersion modeling of particles and volatile, volatile chemicals associated with intensive pesticide applications over agricultural fields. The second part of the talk will focus on the impact of air emissions associated with oil and gas development, production, and transportation activities, with focus on recent shale oil and gas development in Texas over the past two decades. In the final part of the talk, he will also share findings from source receptor and source apportionment analysis techniques using long-term ambient measurements of speciated hydrocarbons and fine particulate matter. With great pleasure, we welcome you, sir, and over to you. Thank you, Ms. Pradeep. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Professor Kurila, now you can share from your side. Uh, thank you. Can you see my slides? Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone in India and uh, good evening from North Texas. So as uh, Ms. Pradeep had introduced me, uh, I'm currently located at the University of North Texas. I'll be focusing on emerging and unconventional sources of pollution, uh, particularly from an air quality management perspective and focus on air quality modeling initiatives. As I watched the slide presentation by Professor Nagendra, I realized that I'm in a really elite com company, particularly with stalwarts like Akula Venkatram and uh, uh, Dr. Curry. Uh, they are all, precede, they all precede me in air quality modeling activities over the years. And I'll try my best to make a, a modest effort in addressing the modeling initiatives at multiple scales that address uh, both new and emerging and even unconventional sources of air pollution. Uh, I'm, it's a fairly ambitious uh, task, 
I cautioned uh, Professor Nagindra that I may or may not be able to cover the entire spectrum of discussion that I uh, originally outlaid, but I will make an attempt to address the first two broad uh, portions of my discussion, and if time permits, I will segue into the source apportionment analysis. So, as I was introduced, most of my background is primarily in the area of atmospheric modeling. Uh, that has been my uh, bread and butter over the last three decades in air quality research. Uh, over the last two decades, I forayed into atmospheric monitoring of air pollution, uh, in a, including running a large network of in compliance grade monitoring net stations in Corpus Christi, Texas. And more recently, over the last decade, I've been involved in the construction of a zero energy house and looking at uh, low cost and portable air quality sensors and development of those. Uh, we have now currently undergraduate student teams working on uh, using drone technology for atmospheric measurement applications. So uh, just a quick uh, primer on where I'm located. I'm located in the Dallas Fort Worth area as travel has uh, opened up and the skies have opened up post COVID, uh, I would be want, uh, welcome. I would welcome you all to come and visit us in the North Texas area. I'm currently located in Denton, uh, which is north of the Dallas Fort Worth metropolitan area. This is a very large urban location with uh, about roughly 7.7 .7 million population, not quite the size of Chennai. I, I'm, I'll admit. Uh, in the U United States, over the last two decades, uh, we have seen significant decrease in air pollution over the years, and uh, particularly both in PM 2.5 and ozone. I will be predicating some of my discussion on these two maxims, looking at declining trends. However, we worry about uh, new sources of pollutions and unconventional sources of pollutions that can either alter the balance or affect the declining trends. So for today's discussion, I will talk about uh, a three-part initiative. The first part will be focused on a very hyper-local uh, activities of pesticide application from an agricultural and a rural area, uh, more focused on in the, in the neonicotinoids, which are uh, banned in the EU, and currently still an application in the United States and the rest of the world, they affect bee pop, uh, the pollinating species of bees, and they are a major concern overall in the declining bee population from an ecological standpoint. So I will uh, allude to the work done by a former student of mine, along with a colleague of mine at Ohio University. So I will be borrowing most of the material here from Baha'i University and share some of the research findings. Subsequently, in part two, we will talk about photochemical modeling of shale oil and gas. This has been a huge uh, explosion of energy sources uh, and resulting in unconventional emissions of uh, ozone and precursor emissions and also for fine particulate matter from oil and gas development activities. Uh, and I'll focus in on activities in the North Texas domain and give you some insights over the last two decades. And this is predominantly work done in my group by graduate students and former graduate students, and I'll share highlights from that. And finally, if I time permits, I will segue into source apportionment analysis of measured PM 2.5 and uh, the volatile organic compounds, looking at a small urban industrialized corridor uh, in a coastal margin of South Texas. This is again work done by former students and current students, and if time permits, we'll get into that. Then I'll share some closing thoughts on emerging and con uh, new sources of pollution that may be relevant both in the, in the context of the United, United States and also relevant in the context of India and also from a global perspective. So a lot of focus in this talk will be on uh, modeling, modeling at different scales modeling at different resolution, and uh, both on the spatial and temporal scale applications. Uh, we will talk about uh, uh, less complex models like dispersion models and Lagrangian plume transport models, to more complex models like chemical transport models, which, are, uh, uh, which require detailed emissions inventory, and which also requires air monitoring data 
feeding into these chemical transport models. Most of these models are been uh, developed on the bedrock of advection diffusion uh, equations developed at least from the old uh, fluid mechanics perspective or Navier Stokes formulation, uh, addressing advection and diffusion and uh, processes and chemical reaction processes in the atmosphere. We kind of treat, uh, uh, being a chemical engineer, the analogy that I draw is treating the entire Earth's atmosphere as a giant continuous stir tank reactor. And we look at the uh, mixing of uh, chemicals and pollutants that contribute to the formation of air pollution events. And finally, we will also address some of the data analysis and visualization using open source tools, including R, Python, and even GIS software. Um, so for the first part of discussion, I'm going to go into a hyperlocal application of dispersion modeling of pesticides. And I want to uh, give credit to two students, uh, a former student, Cycle Ghosh, and my colleague, Professor Kevin Christ at Ohio University. Saika did his master's with me and then went on to work as a research scientist with Professor Christ in Ohio and subsequently earned his PhD in chemical and biomolecular engineering. And he's now an atmospheric research scientist at Pacific National Northwest Laboratory in Washington. Uh, and he's uh, working on nuclear areas of research. So, you know, part of the research that Cycad worked on was looking at dispersion modeling of abraded seed dust. Uh, we are now getting into uh, not only genetically modified seeds, but we are also getting into seeds that are pre-coated with pesticides uh, that are applied for uh, taking into account these uh, pest uh, problems that are rampant across the United States. So to address those, they, uh, the chemical companies are working with seed manufacturers and looking at a braided seed dust. And what happens when you plant these seeds, how does these seed dust uh, disperse and get affected? So we'll take a case study where we will be looking at seed dust from a real-time application on a test fees uh, case study in Ohio, in Iowa. And we are particularly interested in these seed dust because of the fact that they contain Thiamethoxone, methoxone, which is a neonicotinoid, and neonicotinoids are notorious in the fact that they have been decimating bee population and bee colonies across the globe. And so the bee poisoning has been a direct exposure to aerial drift from these agricultural or intensive agricultural applications and agricultural production facilities. So uh, we take the data that was collected in a field site, uh, which is roughly about a 200 meter by 50 meter uh, location uh, in, on which a tractor or a, an app with an application device is going traversing. And uh, we also factor in the meteorological measurements uh, that is done through a MET station located at the STAR, which is a weather station. And we have sensors or uh, detectors located, which are essentially petri dishes filled with crystal and water placed at different distances from the field site. And the METS data was collected for every two seconds. And they used a John Deere planter in Iowa to do this uh, testing. And the samples were then subsequently analyzed for TMX or thymethoxin in an ag agroscience lab. So if you look at the cartoon here, a tractor going across the field site with the wind blowing, we are able to collect those measured uh, facility and then be able to monitor the data and uh, then try to replicate it through a modeling platform. So Cycle used uh, Gaussian pool models and Lagrangian particle models as two rudimentary modeling infrastructure to explain the uh, travel of these abraded seed dust containing T T M uh, TMX. And so as the you know, tractor moves around the, or the, with the planter, uh, the particle size uh, in, uh, is distributed across or dispersed with, in the wind. So an average particle size used in, used in this particular simulation range from five to 2000 micrometer with about uh, five distinct bins, so particle size bins, 
and the approximate dust collected in these size bins were given in the second column, and the fraction of TMX on these particles was also provided in the third column. And so these particle data was collected and simulated in using Gaussian plume model, which in this case, the reference frame was rotated for each grid as a plume moves with the direction of wind. And those of you who are getting new, fairly new in the Gaussian plume model, this has been around since the 1950s. And there was a wonderful talk preceding this by Professor Venkatran, who I watched his presentation and that presentation, he covered quite a bit of the basics on uh, Gaussian plume dispersion modeling techniques. In a sense, uh, it was applied to plumes coming from industrial stacks at an effective stack height, which was uh, in a, adjusted with the buoyancy factor of the plume rise. And then the plume is then dispersed along the conical profile uh, and eventually settling down. So the concentration downwind along X, Y, Z and uh, along the height uh, factors or uh, plume height is factored in based on the emissions rate and the wind speeds. And then we factor in the Stokes law uh, uh, approximated settling velocity and the vertical and horizontal dispersion coefficients allowing for the plume uh, to disperse from a source. So we use this approach on a Cartesian grid receptor and discrete receptor sites to uh, measure the concentration at the ground level or ground level concentration at Z equal to zero, uh, accounting for the settling velocity aspects. Similarly, a Lagrangian plume part or particle model was applied where you will factor in the release of particles and you will also count the particles settling down, further downwind. And it is a, a traditional modeling tool, so a fairly rudimentary approach, looking at particle release and particle distribution across a, a three-dimensional space. And so when we look at these two types of modeling approaches, we are effectively trying to detect or determine the ground level concentrations from these modeling analysis and from these modeling studies. So here's a little bit of an animation as a tractor moves the plume from the planter. And this is again, a very first order assessment of the plumes that is being controlled by or modulated by the wind speed and wind direction. And as a plume comes over the petri dishes or the receptor site or the collection site, you will end up seeing the collection of dust. And you'll subsequently see on the right, the concentration increases as the plume starts to go over the receptor site. So this is a very easy approximation. Uh, you have different techniques out there. There's air mod, which uh, several of you are familiar with. US EPA has publicly available software tools that you can apply. Uh, in this case, Cycad Bosch modified the air mod uh, technique or receptor technique for Gaussian concentration plume modeling to uh, ad adapt it to this particular application of agricultural pesticide uh, and application study. And subsequently, he also applied the Lagrangian concentration plume model. And you notice that you also have a very similar approximation of the concentration profile distribution. Uh, obviously, the concept hot zones are very close to the planter location. And as the wind disperses the pollutants, you will see that the pollutants are uh, distributed further away from the field. And as it hits the concentration recept or receptor sites, you will see increase in concentration. And that's animated on the right side you'll start to see increases in concentration as a distance from field. So uh, two very uh, simple model, modeling tool sets that can address, uh, uh, at least in a first order assessment, what the models would show or what the analysis would show in terms of uh, very intense hyperlocal application of uh, agricultural pesticides or even uh, pesticide-laden dust. So uh, looking at model observation versus uh, model predictions, you find that the deposition uh, is obviously a function of uh, air concentration and deposition velocity, which is totally dependent on the particle size as we, as most of you are familiar with the settling velocity of particles in the atmosphere, uh, the particle size has an uh, 
inordinate influence on the deposition rates. And the prediction in this case was with a factor 1.7 to the observed deposition. Uh, the Lagrangian models uh, uh, did not perform as well as the Gaussian plume model. Uh, however, to get a better characterization, uh, the emission characterization, we can use this as a first order approximation tool sets to get a decent sense of what the concentration downwind would look like for these types of applications. And as uh, uh, distance from the field increases, most of these models converge, obviously, the near the field site will have higher variability or higher distribution and concentration variability. We're able to simulate this on a three-dimensional approach uh, as the part tractor moves. Uh, the release height of the particles from the tractor was about 1.8 meters, so that's fairly high. Uh, most of the applications are further lower, closer to the ground. The maximum concentration that was measured was about 14 microgram per cubic meter. So uh, Dr. Ghosh was able to understand the particle size, particle morphology for a typical particle size of 25 micrometer and how as the wind blows and the distance, this is along the y-axis distance from the edge of the field and x-axis distance along the field, you would start to see the concentration gradients and concentration variance, and you can also detect the vertical profiles of these as you know, the plume moves over away from the uh, application site. And if you increase the particle sizes, you will obviously have a slightly different profiles with 60 micrometer particles and 112.5 micrometer particles you have different concentration profiles. Obviously, the larger particles will deposit closer to the application site and will not get carried over as far as lighter or smaller particles. And so you're able to mimic the uh, three-dimensional structure of plume geometry out of these types of particle releases. And these types of rudimentary models are wonderful tools for doing initial assessment or initial analysis of uh, pesticide or pesticide, pesticide application. This has been a big problem over the years, not only from the fact that we have abraded dust from 2.5 that is coated with pesticide that can have lingering effects and affect uh, bee populations through neonicotinoids or other types of harmful chemicals, but there is an intense discussion on some of these pesticides that are, have also a volatile components or volatile uh, behavior the volatility of these uh, pesticides uh, have a large uh, oversized influence in the eastern part of the United States, which is fairly agricultural intensive, particularly in the Midwest. And this is uh, an estimation of agriculture use of metallochlor, uh, which is uh, widely used in corn and soybean applic uh, applications. And so we wanted to look at the volatilization from soil of intense applications of pesticides across the uh, uh, rural domain. So uh, Dr. Ghosh developed a, a pesticide emissions model, which he was hoping to then couple it with a chemical transport model to assess the influence of volatile chemicals and how that affects urban and uh, maybe even regional uh, atmospheric chemistry. So we are looking at soil partitioning of these uh, chemicals from the soil and the volatilization uh, into the uh, into the atmosphere, and so you have three levels of volatilization. Uh, there is off-gassing from the soil, off-gassing from soil plant itself, and then there is also the uh, at, uh, during the process of application, there is the volatilization that can be impacted through atmospheric transport, and some of these heavier chemicals can uh, stick to the soil and then get uh, add to the runoff into the both into the surface water and groundwater systems. And so there is significant interest in the US Environmental Protection Agency and US Department of Agriculture looking at these types of uh, intense you know, pesticide applications and volatility of not only pesticides but also in fertilizer applications and looking at its influence on regional photochemistry. So uh, Psycho Ghosh, uh, Dr. Ghosh developed a pesticide emissions model, uh, factoring in all different characters of the factors that go into 
these model development. And I've looked at pesticide properties, the vapor pressure, Henry's uh, law constant, solubility of these pesticides, the absorption coefficient. He also looked at the practices of you know, from an agricultural application. Uh, a lot of these industrialized, industrial grade applications or agricultural facilities are humongous, um, multi acre ranches. And so there's intense agricultural applications of both pesticides and fertilizers in these lands. And so he accounted for these different types of application grades, both seasonal and also in terms of the intensity of application during tilling. Uh, he also looked at the properties of the plants, uh, the type of vegetation and the canopy that uh, can contribute to off gassing from these types of uh, plant material. He also looked at the uh, soil types, and that is a huge factor depending on whether you're in a semi arid area or you're in a fairly tropical area. You will have differences in characteristics of soil uh, and, and how that can contribute to uh, venting. It's another aspect that one needs to factor in is during droughts, and we, we, we have had several intense droughts in California, which is also an agricultural rich region and also in the Midwest that can affect off gassing of both pesticides and uh, fertilizers. And finally, last but not the least, okay, factoring in meteorological conditions, the air temperature, solar radiation, wind speed, precipitation, humidity, all these factor into the development of a uh, pesticide emissions model. This is what probably one of the more complex models that has been developed, and I give full credit to Dr. Ghosh for the development of this model. Uh, it is built on the framework of prior work done uh, at multiple institutions. And so uh, they, he's used data from the National Climate Data Centers uh, for developing these models for meteorological conditions. He's gotten data from the US Department of Agriculture looking at soil characteristics and soil properties and effectively developing uh, energy and moisture balance around the uh, study area to uh, quantify the amount of emissions of pesticides. So two case studies that he looked at, uh, he looked at applications of two particular types of chemicals, but in this example, he's looking at the uh, water content on the left side in an application in Worcester, Ohio, uh, during a, a summer period of uh, July 14 to 16. And there was another study done in 2018, uh, also during July month, uh, looking at the uh, moisture profile and looking at the uh, energy balance during this, uh, both the radiation and, uh, and the heat, heat profiles. So he applied it to two uh, specific uh, intense pesticides that are used widely in agricultural practices in the Midwest. Uh, metallochlor uh, and 1,3-dichloropropene, and he was able to uh, again, mimic the emissions uh, using uh, using his pesticide emissions model, and he compared it to observations that uh, were in the literature, both by Kruger et al. and Anderson et al., comparing and contrasting the measured values to his emissions modeling uh, to a specific application. And you notice that the models did very well, reasonably well, mimicking the emissions released from actual observations from these two field site measurement. So, um, where do we go from here for this type of uh, uh, unusual, unconventional, and even newly emerging pollution uh, applications? Uh, here is a process which uh, there is an intense discussion right now. Uh, looking at uh, both national scale and regional scale photochemical modeling or regional transport modeling processes using uh, the, the comprehensive multi scale air quality model platform that is an open source tool available through US EPA and uh, other venues. And so you uh, feed in with the GIS data. This is for the state of California, for instance. You provide vegetation cover. You're looking at uh, the emissions from the spatial allocation for the types of plant material and soil fluxes. You add in input the parameters of meteorological data, land use and land cover characterization using uh, LIDAR profilers and or looking at uh, information from uh, satellite measurements or remotely sensed data. Uh, and then feed it into these uh, community scale models for air quality. 
which basically mimics or models advection diffusion and chemical transformation in the atmosphere on a, on a very large scale. And you're able to actually um, uh, look at the aerosol characterization, uh, production of uh, primary and secondary aerosols, and also transport of long range transport information. And uh, subsequently, from using the CMAC as output, you can then visualize uh, looking at uh, graphical uh, overlays of concentration profiles across the uh, United States or across the study region. So, the development of these types of intense modeling uh, tools or for pesticide emissions models will add to the complexity of emissions processing and emissions uh, pre processes for these large scale chemical transport modeling systems. So, I'm going to pivot to a second type of uh, non uh, conventional sources of emission. Uh, this is more uh, germane to uh, oil and gas industry. Uh, there has been increasing exploration of shale oil and gas, and this I've, I'm seeing now happening globally, including in India. Uh, but the uh, early days of shale oil and gas happened in Texas, and subsequently there has been a growth in this. Uh, domain. And so I will focus on this discussion on photochemical modeling of shale oil and gas emissions. And if time permits, I'll also pivot to the third part of the talk on source of ocean analysis of measured PM2.5 and VOCs. So this work was done uh, by two of both, both the former student, Dr. Guaquan Lin, who's currently an atmospheric scientist at California Air Resource Board. And my current PhD student, Jitin Kanen Kotuboil, who is a PhD candidate. Jitin is also a formally affiliated as a research scientist working at Professor Nagendra's group and at IIT Madras. And uh, he joined uh, the mechanical engineering PhD program uh, at UNT. So, for those who are uninitiated in the natural gas or the oil and gas industry, natural gas is a supposedly a cleaner burning. Fuel. Uh, it is replacing coal uh, in power plants, in, at least across the United States. It's also replacing oil as a, a fuel source for combustion. Uh, natural gas is uh, available abundantly in, uh, in uh, oil and gas deposits, including in uh, tight pore spaces within shale formations and then coal bed uh, methane traps. And it's also trapped in the ice and sea flow as gas hydrates. Uh, there is conventional ways of extracting natural gas and there's also the unconventional ways. Uh, I'll focus on the unconventional one because that's been pretty much in the uh, in a domain over the last two decades, looking at oil and gas extraction by flooding or using fracking techniques or hydraulic fracturing of shale rocks and shale vent formation. So in the United States, there is large deposits of uh, shale plays. Uh, I will particularly focus on the Barnett Shale in the North Texas area. This is the state of Texas in the South. Uh, there is now big developments in North Dakota. There's large developments in the Ohio, Pennsylvania, the Eastern uh, part of the United States. And now there's been recent developments in Southern Texas domain. Uh, in the West Texas area, it's uh, where we see conventional oil and gas. Now they are pivoting to uh, shale formation and shale extraction in the West Texas domain as well. So, uh, the first use of hydraulic fracturing, we just fracture using high pressure uh, water and using profits and uh, so sand into the shale formation. Uh, later, it was combined with horizontal drilling in the 1970s, and these fracking techniques was first used to extract oil and gas after they exhausted conventional deposits in Barnett Shale in North Texas in the 1990s. Uh, we've had significant extraction of vast amounts of hydrocarbons, and that has allowed the U.S. to become a net exporter of oil and gas in the 2020s, right during the pandemic. The shale gas typically contains a approximately 90%, about 88 to 90% of methane. And I'll come back to methane later because that's going to be a big a source of a new emerging uh, source of pollutant, which we are all worried about because it has a greenhouse gas warming potential, which is much higher than carbon dioxide, even though the levels of methane emissions may not be at the same scale. 
So a cartoon on the left side shows the hydraulic fracturing operation, oil and gas industry, where they go through a drill site and they go horizontally across into the shale formations. And then they use uh, pyrotechnics uh, to explode the shale rocks and add fissions through which these increasing pore sizes, you extract oil and gas. They primarily did that for extracting uh, liquids. And then as they exhausted liquids, they started finding gas and they started applying and extracting gas from these deposits. Uh, if you look uh, at these oil and gas facilities, there are huge pad facilities where a drill rig is set up and there's a significant extract, extraction of uh, energy from these locations. Uh, this is as a, when a, a flight track flying from Texas to Wyoming. You can see these pad sizes are littered all over the landscape around the North Texas domain. And this is around the Dallas Fort Worth area. And you'll see tremendous amount of oil and gas pad sites and oil and gas exploration sites. So what does this mean? Uh, this is a recent snapshot. Uh, and there's a state agency in the uh, state of Texas. Uh, Texas is uh, in, in a very large state with blessed with huge amounts of oil and gas deposits. Uh, so the red dots are gas wells, the blue dots are oil wells. Uh, you can basically see that there's something close to about 450,000 oil and gas wells within the state of Texas and that are currently active. Uh, there are also abandoned wells and closed wells that are also adding to the burden. So a lot of the new wells are along the Eagle Foot Shale Formation. Uh, there's a mature formation in Violet Shale. I'll talk about that in my next set of slides. And there's the conventional oil and gas extraction, and now they're pivoting to uh, a shale form extraction in the uh, Permian Basin in the West Texas area. So oil, oil and gas is a major source of uh, economy in Texas. So uh, to the left, you see as the year progresses from 1990 to 2014 or so, you see increasing production and drilling activities of oil and gas. The black ones are vertical drilling. And somewhere around 2000, we started getting into horizontal drilling and we started extracting even more oil and gas. And you start to see these reds are horizontally drilled sites. And that started to uh, permeate across the domain. Uh, Dallas is located here, the uh, city of Denton is located up in this county, and the city of Fort Worth is located here. If you all ever fly into Dallas, the airport is right between Dallas and Fort Worth, it's called the DFW airport, and that's located right where the market that is. So you see that up to 2010, there's been significant development of oil and gas, and see that to the right, you see the Barnett Shale, that is the shale region, the overall oil and gas production activities from 2000 to 2012, it peaked in 2012. I will, I'm happy to report that now this is a mature field. It is not declining production over the years. So we want to see, and until about 2012, we were also extracting liquids like oil and condensate liquids from these drill facilities. So in terms of barrels of uh, oil and condensate liquids coming from these sites, we were extracting quite a bit of uh, liquids and then significant amount of uh, gas or natural gas containing the methane uh, was extracted and that peaked around 2012 and it since has declined. So we will look at the implication over the last two decades on what it did to oil and air quality in this urban and semi-urban or ex-urban regions. So where do these uh, emissions come from? The oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compound and particular metal are primarily associated during the development phase of an oil and gas site. That is when the drill rig hits the, uh, punctures the earth and uh, uses fracturing pump and there's a lot of truck traffic coming in and out. So that contributes to NOx and PM. And then subsequently, once we extract the uh, hydrocarbons, we end up getting VOC emissions from these facilities. Once these drill sites are uh, capped off or well sites are producing, then most of the uh, production goes uh, into VOC level, very low levels of PM and NOx. So PM comes from compressor or wellhead compressors at these facilities or even compressors for distribution, pipe to pipeline distribution activities. 
but uh, most of the VOCs then subsequently come from storage tags or condensing tags uh, located at the facilities. And then last but not the least, there is a third dimension of these oil and gas sites. So once they have extracted the hydrocarbon, then they abandon the wells. They're supposed to cap it off and seal it and then periodically test these wells to make sure that it's not releasing. We have had intense issues of abandoned wells or capped off wells you know, producing or releasing emissions uh, from these facilities because they're not being maintained well properly over the years. So that's been a, a big growing problem in the state of Texas. The second big problem is the infrastructure of pipelines. These pipelines are also resulting in uh, decaying or uh, corroding pipelines over the years that has contributed to oil and gas releases in these areas. So what does that mean in terms of air quality? So the US EPA in its, uh, uh, through the Clean Air Act and its subsequent amendments has designated several areas and some in Texas as being non-attainment of ozone and particulate matter. In the eastern half of the, uh, Texas, they're all urban areas and I'll be focusing on Dallas Fort Worth region that's located in the north. And then there is Houston, Galveston. These are two non-attainment areas for ozone. There are new up and coming areas of uh, Austin, San Antonio with very rapid population growth and industrialization that's occurring. And also in Corpus Christi, Texas, these are called the near non-attainment areas. They're still in attainment, but very close to the threshold where they could potentially violate the standards. As of the last year, the area of San Antonio has violated the standards of and the air quality standards for ozone. There's one region in the state of Texas that is currently in non attainment of particulate matter standard of PM10 and PM2.5. That's in El Paso, Texas, around the US Mexico border region. So I'm going to be focusing uh, for the uh, remainder of this talk in the North Texas domain. And within the North Texas, I'll focus on the impact of. Uh, the oil and gas activities, that's all these red and blue dots uh, adjoining or abetting, abutting a urban uh, corridor. And I will be focusing on three counties, and this was work done by uh, both my former graduate student, uh, Dr. Guo Kwan Lin, and my current graduate student, Jitham Tanin Kutupoyan. They extracted publicly available data for air quality measurements that are operated by the state of Texas, and there are multiple sites. So you see yellows and greens. I'm gonna be picking on these three green sites in Dallas, Fort Worth, and Denton. And I also mainly focus on Denton to begin with because Dallas is a large urban site with very limited uh, oil and gas activities. Fort Worth is a mixed urban and oil and gas industrial activity site that has got it's within the Barnett Shale. It has got a lot of oil and gas act production activities, but they also have tighter regulation. And then finally, in Denton, which, which is lax in regulation uh, for oil and gas facilities, they are also on the edge of the oil and gas uh, activities within the Barnett Shale. So we will look at the characteristics differences over the last two decades in terms of air quality uh, behavior. So for uh, the ozone, the design value has changed over the uh, last two decades. The standard or the national ambient air quality standard was at about 80 parts per billion, eight hour average standard that is average over three years. Uh, that has since been tightened to 75 through 2015. And then since 2015, it's the current standard is 70 parts per billion. As the standards have been tightened, it uh, really is, it tells us two different stories. One, there is a declining trend over the year to year since two, uh, over the two decades. However, uh, the area in Denton, which is shown in green, has consistently been above the other two sites, which are the more urban sites. Denton is a rural or exurban uh, site with uh, abundance of oil and gas production activities. Uh, what you see here in Dallas, that decline in 2008 and 9 was due to a downturn in the economic uh, recession that resulted in a cleaner air and then subsequently it bounced back up. And all of these sites were in non compliance for the ozone levels until 2015. Once it's tightened the standards further, these three sites have continued to remain in uh, non compliance. However, 
uh, the urban sites now are starting to see uh, behave or are at higher levels than exurban or rural sites like Denton. And I'll tell you a story of the tale of the oil and gas behavior over the years. So uh, in 2015, uh, a former student, Madhya Amadi, published a paper looking at the ozone production activities we published in Science of the Total Environment, and we found characteristic differences in shale gas region and non-shale gas region and how they contributed to the ozone formation. And we did just looked at the statistical trends. We did not do a photochemical assessment, but we just looked at statistical trends, and he found uh, in, uh, the shale gas regions were uh, about approximately 8% higher than non-shale gas regions for a study period of about 14 years of data. Uh, we took now 20 years of data, and we find that uh, while ozone has been fairly stubborn, uh, the, uh, a, a rural or exurban site in Denton had uh, a high, higher levels of ozone than in Dallas or Fort Worth over the years, and that has consistent to continue to persist. Uh, this is despite the fact that oxides of nitrogen has declined over the years, and most of this is attributable to uh, power plant and, and reductions in fixed uh, sources of uh, major uh, thermal power plants around the region. There's about 13 of them around the region. Uh, some of them were mothballed, but they moved away from coal to natural gas. And so they also had added influence of uh, control technologies implemented in these power plant facilities or electric generating units. And so that is contributed. And secondary contribution from tailpipe from automotive sources the cars have gotten cleaner over the years, despite the fact that the vehicle miles traveled have increased over the last two decades due to population increase. We are starting to see cleaner cars, and that has contributed to a decline in oxides of nitrogen over the last two decades. But the stubbornness of ozone uh, was an you know, open-ended question. So we looked at the measured values of total non-methane organic compounds. These folks are measured once in six days using canister samples and then sent to a lab for uh, me measuring ozone precursor hydrocarbon concentrations. And so as we looked at these, we find that in Denton, we had very high levels of ozone. So roughly about two times higher than Dallas and uh, or three times higher than Dallas, uh, or roughly two times higher and uh, close to about two times higher than, than Fort Worth. And that would indicate that there is a significant uh, pool or reservoir of hydrocarbons primarily the N-alkanes in the Denton area. So uh, looking at two indicator species, uh, one on the left is an acetylene. Acetylene is a, a tailpipe emissions uh, signature species. You find that the acetylene to TNMOC ratios uh, have been in declining, suggesting that the cars are getting cleaner. We are getting a uh, significant decline in the emissions from tailpipes from automotive sources or mobile sources. And then we're looking at ethane, we find that Denton area had much higher levels of ethane than Fort Worth and, uh, and subsequently Dallas, suggesting the influence. And ethane is a strong, uh, ethane and methane are obviously uh, uh, N-alkanes associated with oil and gas production activities. So it's kind of two tails of two different industry sources that can influence the uh, ozone formation and or act, contribute to the ozone precursor emissions in the urban Code. So, looking at NOx to TNMOC profile in these urban locations, we find that they have a, they mimic the heat zones, suggesting the typical NOx to TNMOC ratios in Dallas uh, that ranges between 10, uh, or TNMOC to NOx ratios are about roughly 10 uh, or so. And then we compare that to Denton, which is a rural area the TNMOC levels are much higher. And uh, this is obviously not coming from forested regions. We don't have many large forests or biogenic emission sources. So most of these are attributed to oil and gas production activities. So we are talking about an order of magnitude or even two orders of magnitude larger than the other uh, so two urban areas. Where the NOx median concentration is roughly about 6.73, the TNMOC median concentration is roughly about 100 parts per billion of carbon. So you see these differences in behavior in terms of what's in the urban atmosphere. So that could potentially contribute to some level of uh, increase uh, 
in the uh, photochemical activities, even if it is as a result of slow reacting hydrocarbons. So we wanted to look at these ratios of TNMOC. Mind you, these are not VOC to NOx ratios, not the volatile organic compounds. We we're just looking at all non-methane organic compounds. And we find that in Dallas Fortwood area, the ratios were roughly about one to four during high ozone days. So the red boxes, all those values when we had high ozone days, greater than 75 parts per billion. In Fort Worth, which is kind of a mixed cis, uh, area with urban emissions and industrial emissions, the TNMOC to NOx ratios will range from two to 10, uh, also during high ozone days. And you compare that to the Denton site, Denton site had a wide variation of TNMOC to NOx ratio, ranging from 0. 0.6 to 460, orders of magnitude higher than the urban sites suggesting that during high ozone days, and we also had many more high ozone days in Denton than in the other two sites. So that kind of leads us to question, are we capturing all the emissions in these types of uh, decision-making processes using air quality modeling tools? So a typical summertime propane concentration, we find that the Dallas and Fort Worth mimicked what was reported in 38 urban areas in the US. That range from 0.87 to 10.53 parts per billion carbon, uh, whereas in Denton mimicked something from a rural or an oil and gas production regions, uh, similar to ones found in Colorado and also in the Marcella Shale in Pennsylvania, so suggesting that there was an outsized influence of oil and gas activities in these regions. Another way to skin this cat is to look at isopentane to n-pentane uh, ratios. And if the ratios are greater than one, those regions are influenced by vehicular emissions. So you see Dallas and Fort Worth have stronger influence of vehicular emissions. Fort Worth is leaning somewhere in between, whereas Denton was more or less less than one, suggesting that that is a, a tantamount to areas that are uh, very close to higher oil and gas production regions. So. A, a, the tale to tell for Denton Airport and even Fort Worth to a large, smaller extent is that the ethane to TNMOC ratios will, would also suggest an uh, influence of oil and gas activities. So we wanted to see what are these oil and gas activities that contribute to these regions. So Jitin went and pulled from the GIS data looking at all of the oil and gas production facilities around the region. And we find the city of Denton uh, monitoring site is located surrounded by all of these oil and gas pad sites nearby within five and 10 mile radius. The, those are you know, the ones that one, three and five mile radius are the ones that will have significant influence on the mesh and hydrocarbons at this facility. Uh, there is much lower amounts distributed along the Fort Worth area uh, and hardly any in Dallas. And what we find that Facilities within one mile of the from the monitoring site had contributed significantly to the uh, measured hydrocarbon at the, in the air monitoring site. And you see the trend over the last two decades, the air monitoring site trends mimicked the uh, production, gas production at all the facilities within a one mile radius around the uh, oil and gas production facility and, and around the air monitoring facility. We looked at within these uh, levels, both the oil and gas production facility, uh, green, uh, the, the column charts are the production facilities in Fort Worth and Denton. And you notice that the so line charts are also the number of active gas wells. These are wells that are producing and actively uh, emitting emissions uh, around these regions. And that contributes to uh, measured values of increased measurements of hydrocarbons in these regions. Uh, we were able to uh, test this hypothesis using uh, first order uh, analysis of coupling with wind, wind speed and wind direction or a pollution growth profile. Uh, so the monitoring site is located and the uh, yellow dot here surrounded by all of the oil and gas facilities uh, so with the elevation. And you start to see that a facilities, a cluster of facilities, which is around the Five mile radius, uh, 10 kilometer radius in this example is in kilometers, had a significant amount of oil and gas production area that contributed to ethane. So, this is actually ethane concentration coupled with the wind speed and wind direction 
suggesting the influence of these rich you know, deposits or rich production facilities or density of oil and gas activities upwind of the monitoring site. And overall, all the to uh, total non methane organic compound, you find they are all to the west and to the southwest of the monitoring facility for to total non methane organic compounds. Uh, did a first order uh, source apportionment analysis and doing this using the positive matrix factorization tool that the US EPA provides. Uh, these are all publicly available tools that are available out there. We find that natural gas dominated, at least in the city of Denton, roughly about 68% of the measured hydrocarbons were attributed to natural gas, uh, both production and storage facilities near the oil and gas, uh, near the ambient air quality monitoring site. All the other uh, side is, uh, sources, including uh, aircraft emissions or solvent usage or vehicle emissions, were much smaller in terms of the contribution of non-methane organic compounds. So we actually took speciated hydrocarbons and threw it into these uh, uh, source apportionment modeling tools like positive or PMF, and to be able to uh, determine or detect the number of factors that contribute to the measure of hydrocarbons. Uh, we uh, subsequently in 2019 uh, uh, published a paper looking at automated gas chromatograph measurements at these um, uh, several sites, both in rural and urban facilities. Uh, we were able to um, uh, depict that these shale gas, active shale gas regions, contribute significantly to measured hydrocarbons in the urban and rural uh, atmospheres. So, coming back to the ozone uh, uh, conundrum. We wanted to see, well, the ozone levels are going down. That's a good news. We also wanted to see what are the outsized influences of these oil and gas facilities? Are we able to mimic that through chemical transport models? And uh, is this area a NOx sensitive or VOC sensitive or a combination thereof? So we wanted to see an assess. An earlier analysis done by Researchers suggested that this Dallas Fort Worth area was traditionally seen as being NOx sensitive, which would suggest that if you reduce NOx, the ozone levels would come down. So those NOx reduction strategies should be uh, at the forefront for controlling ozone, at least from an air quality planning and management perspective. Um, subsequently, through 2012, we find that these, these North Texas areas have became VOC sensitive which would suggest that reduction in VOCs would be uh, needed to continue the reduction of uh, ozone levels in these regions. However, Denton showed a slightly different pattern which would indicate that both NOx and VOC reductions are needed. So we cannot have a one-size-fits-all strategy in these areas. To test this hypothesis, we used uh, uh, data uh, or, or what we call ozone formation potential calculations for uh, this measured hydrocarbon, uh, speciated hydrocarbons, using Carter's mechanism. And Carter, uh, Bill Carter's work was uh, being used both in photochemical modeling work. Uh, he's located at UC Riverside, and his work has been used widely for photochemical model development from smoke chamber chemistry to uh, testing in terms of the incremental formation or the activity of hydrocarbons to the formation of ozone. And as we see Dallas and Fort Worth, the outsized influences of reactive hydrocarbons that are double bonded and triple bonded alkanes and alkynes, alkenes and alkynes contribute more to the formation of ozone than the pinks, which are alkanes and alkanes, suggesting that these are, are dependent on highly reactive hydrocarbons that contribute to ozone formation in Dallas Fort Worth. So that is a, a tourism that has been seen and observed around urban areas across the U.S. However, in Denton, we see the outsized influence of ozone formation from N-alkanes, or slow-reacting hydrocarbons, and that suggests that there is large pools of N-alkanes associated with oil and gas activities that can contribute or affect or alter the photochemical uh, reactivities in the atmosphere. So we wanted to test this using chemical transport models, a quick primer on chemical transport models. These are three dimensional and in fact, four dimensional if you also factor time variations, uh, four dimensional models. 
that are actually taken in the in our global context. They, we have global models, we have large scale regional or continental scale models to urban scale models and even down to very local scale uh, you know, urban action or chemical transport models that uh, work on the continuity equation derivation of the advection diffusion calculations. So you look at looking at it from a box model perspective of uh, advection of uh, uh, meteorological parameters or advection of wind. Uh, and then if you have sources within the box and the, uh, allowing for photochemical transformation within the box, we can then look at the transport of pollutants outside the boxes. And these can be mimicked over large global regional uh, scale. So uh, looking at these chemical transport models, there are different uh, uh, modeling tools out there. There is the community scale, multi-scale uh, multi air quality models, or known, or widely known as CMAC. And then there are CAMEX models, which are used by uh, other aid state agencies, including Texas, that takes meteorological pre-processes and emissions pre-process data including emission and bound to condition and thrown into these chemical transport models. These models are fairly complex and you have to operate them on these highly uh, high performance computing clusters. And uh, we, uh, we can actually spend a huge amount of time um, uh, modeling these pre-processes, meteorological models like WERF or MM5. These are large scale weather uh, uh, forecasting models that are used as inputs to these chemical transport models. And similarly, with uh, emissions processing is done using smoke or emissions processing system. Uh, so these are modeling uh, pre-processes that are developing model-ready emissions files for the uh, chemical transport models to crunch. And the output of chemical transport models will give you gas phase and particulate bound chemistry uh, concentrations. It will give you wet deposition, dry deposition. It will also be able to use for visibility and haze calculations. Uh, for the influence of the large scale uh, for chemical transformation of the atmosphere. So in the case in point, we can use meteorological models and looking at meteorological inputs like into WERF or uh, weather forecasting tools that is coupled with a smoke, which is a emissions pre-processing models that is using all different types of emissions like point sources, area sources, non-road on on-road sources, like using different tools to quantify a, in a gridded approach on air emissions, both at the surface and along the model grid systems. And then we couple it with the initial conditions and boundary conditions, and we let the model saturate and run for several days till we get the, the pre-processing done and we get the initial conditions and boundary conditions flushed out. Now we start to run for episodes or looking at historical episodes to see what can we learn from the past history? And we, these models have also been used in a forecast model, forecast mode. And so these types of models are widely used across the region. I just want to give you an example from the CMAC tool where they predicted ozone for June 1 of 2013 and then compared it to actual ozone observations. Uh, you see ozone, high levels of ozone, all these round circular ones are actual ground based measurements of ozone and high levels of ozone in California along the eastern seaboard. And the models were able to mimic that using these uh, transport uh, schemes uh, at a similar profile along the Great Lakes, along the eastern seaboard. And the beauty of these models, then you can see the transport operation over large scale. Um, we applied this uh, with my colleagues in Ohio, looking at uh, air emissions from shale operations shale oil and gas operations. So we were able to quantify emissions from oil and gas facilities, treat them like uh, small minor point sources uh, as input into these chemical transport models. And uh, we were able to look at observed values and all the other parameters of emissions that go into calculating these, uh, uh, enhancing the emissions inventory that then is pre-processed into the CMAC. And we were able to look at what happens with this outsized influence of these new sources and find that there's about uh, anywhere between eight to 10 parts per billion of influence in the state of Pennsylvania out due to these uh, contribution from uh, these uh, unconventional sources of emissions or uncontrolled sources of emissions of oil and gas activities uh, contributing to eight to 10 parts per billion of ozone. 
And then if we were to do a best guess estimate of controlling those emissions, we would be able to bring the emissions down so we can do future casting using these tools to uh, for air quality management analysis. We did a similar work uh, using a different tool called CAMEX, which is widely used by the state of Texas. We applied CAMEX models. Uh, it's also publicly available. We did the same type of chemical pr processing of emissions, uh, source emissions characterization thrown into these models. We also did pre-processing using WOLF, uh, which is a weather uh, forecasting tool uh, for meteorological inputs. And we did it on a nested grid domain. Uh, the outer domain covers the US, Canada, and Mexico. The inner domain covers more, pretty much all of Texas. So this is about 36 kilometer grid resolution. Uh, inner domain is about 12 kilometer grid resolution, 12 by 12. So each of these grids are broken down further and they are nested within each inside. And then we got into the eastern half of Texas, which is where all the urban and uh, now industrial activities are located in East Texas. And we want to look at the influence of urban and regional emissions on ozone formation. And this is a pictorial of the actual ozone, predicted ozone levels. And it compared very well with actual measurements in ozone during this case, uh, case study for 2008 and so. So we use these models and then we went back and the, the beauty of these models are then we can go back and pick and choose the emission regions and emissions to, to develop control strategies. So we wanted to see the outsized influence of these oil and gas activities. So in the Barnard Shale that is located in the Shale oil and gas region, and also in Haynesville Shale, which is adjoining Texas and Louisiana, we wanted to see the overall impact of oil and gas emissions. And we find that with, if you remove all of the NOx and VOC from oil and gas activities from these shale oil gas facilities, we find that there is an uh, improvement of ozone of up to about 5.95 parts per billion within the Barnett Shale and also within the Haynesville region. Zooming in further with the Barnett Shale, this is a 10 county region. The city of Denton is located here, the city of Fort Worth is located here, and the city of Dallas is located here. We were able to see the influence of these uh, on ozone, measured ozone levels. And we find that the Barnett Shale can contribute to about another five part per billion of ozone formation in this region. So with that said, uh, I want to slowly pivot into, and then I will open up for the floor for some discussion. I want to talk about another pollutant type because we focused on mainly non-methane organic compounds, but associated with this is significant amount of methane. And uh, here is a satellite image, and I extracted this from a recent article from BBC, but this is from the uh, European Union's Sentinel satellite that was looking at methane uh, satellite measurements of methane around the United States. And you see these large amounts of methane. Most of these are from oil and gas exploration activities. And then you find these plumes of these large signature plumes of methane. This is actually a satellite measurement of uh, a detection of methane releases. And so we are able to uh, track either using satellite or using uh, now in a flight, flight paths to look down and measure or detect methane leaks. And that can also contribute to additional consternation of greenhouse gas, as methane being a major contributor to greenhouse gas. It is roughly about 28 to 34 times stronger than CO2 as a climate warming agent over the last 100 years or so. And as increasing in methane production increases globally, uh, both from these oil and gas activities and also from industrial farming and industrial uh, operations, we do have to worry about the influence on contribution to climate change. So methane is supposedly, at least in the last IPCC report that came out from 2021, the methane contribution, the range was from between 0.3 to 1 degree Celsius, where CO2 is still higher than that because there's more CO2 abundantly available. Yet, uh, this is a, a new uh, pollutants that we need to keep track of. Uh, and a lot of it is coming from oil and gas production activities. A lot of it is coming from uh, swamp lands and decaying and landfill emissions and industrialized facilities. So I just want to summarize uh, the uh, outsized influence of oil and gas activities we were able to demonstrate using different 
tools, be it uh, measure, uh, measurements and statistical analysis, and also using chemical transport models that the uh, oversized influence of oil and gas contribution on urban and regional air quality is a, a growing area of concern. And there is a significant uh, factor that we need to uh, take into account that there is underreporting of these ozone precursor emissions and subsequently through greenhouse gases such as methane from these large industrialized facilities, not only from during the production activities, but also post production activities. We really need to worry about the underreporting of these emissions. And that's why these types of satellite measurements of drone technologies will help us detect these. Uh, uh, and the outsized influences of chemicals that are contributing to uh, both in the climate change domain and also in the urban and regional inequality domain. The closing thoughts I wanted to share with you, and I know I'm running out of time, Shiva, so I'll just pause here after this and open up the floor for any Q&A. I just want to uh, suggest to, since the audience we may be students, maybe air quality planners, decision makers, or future decision makers, you, we need to start paying increasing attention to not only current pollution levels. I know in India, we are really worried about areas of PM 2.5. Uh, ozone is a growing concern that's going to eventually come up to speed as we start worrying about uh, controlling different types of emission sources or precursors of emissions. We also need to pay attention to new and emerging sources of, and even unconventional pollutant sources of uh, for air emissions that affect urban, regional, rural, and even global air quality. And they also have impact on human and ecosystem. I gave you an example of pesticides or even neonicotinoids that affect bee population. Uh, we need to worry about it. And you, you, know, you all are empowered using tools such as models, be it hyperlocal models or dispersion models, or rudimentary uh, Lagrangian plume models to more complex chemical transport models. And some of these sources and pollutants that we really need to pay attention to as I'm looking at the radar. Uh, would include things like specialized chemicals, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, fungicides, and algicides. There's uh, tons of these uh, insecticide chemicals that are being uh, produced, mass produced. Uh, China and India are some of, among the largest producers of, and users of these pest uh, chemicals. We also need to worry about pest persistent organic pollutants. Uh, there's a huge growing concern uh, across the domain uh, from different types of organic matter that is abundantly available in the lower troposphere. We need to think about heavy metals, including mercury, uh, lead, cadmium. Some of it is associated with coal combustion. Some of it is coming from industrial operations. Uh, there is a growing concern in terms of micro and nanoplastics in the environment. People used to think about it in the ocean. People used to worry about it in water stream systems. But now we are finding that in the atmospheric uh, pathways as deposition tools for micro and nanoplastics, uh, and we are now seeing measurements in the polar regions, uh, in nanoplastics and microplastics and snow deposits. And finally, last but not the least, as we are in a post-pandemic world where we are now dealing with, war, war, I'm not going to quite say world war, but we're dealing with conflicts and wars. Conflicts and wars result in, is in a significant amount of air emissions that we don't even factor in to some of these urban and regional planning activities. So with that, I will pause and open up uh, for uh, an engaged discussion. Uh, ask if you have any questions, uh, if you have any better ideas or suggestions. I'm all ears. I'm here to learn from you all, but I also hope that uh, I'll be able to share some of the learning that we had in the last two decades in this domain. And with that, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kovila, for a wonderful talk, a very comprehensive. And uh, you have given touched upon uh, starting with the uh, concepts and uh, uh, looking at all the three important components like uh, air, water, and uh, uh, soil uh, uh, in terms of uh, giving an idea of uh, how the, the interactions happens and uh, different complexities involved in model and its validation. Uh, it's a very comprehensive uh, you know, uh, talk. Uh, now, before we move on to this uh, question answer session, probably I will give some break to you. And uh, maybe I'll request all of you to just uh, start your camera. We'll have a, uh, you know, a one photo with uh, Professor Kurvilla. Uh, yeah, uh, Shiva, if I could just take a moment. I want to seriously acknowledge my uh, 
you know, the partners in crime, uh, Dr. Professor Christ at Ohio University, you know, Kevin Christ and I were uh, graduate students at the University of Iowa and we continue to collaborate. Uh, for both graduate students in my group and, uh, in, uh, and in his group, both past and present. Uh, the most recent one, Jitin Kanyan Kotopil, I believe Jitin is on this call. Uh, he is uh, Professor Nagendra's former research scientist and I was able to recruit him from IIT Madras and I thank you all for loaning him to me. Uh, he's done some outstanding work in my group. Uh, I have a re new petroleum engineer who's joined my group, Rayan Ali Mohammed, who's getting into the petroleum aspect of it. Uh, I've got a former student, Dr. Bokwan Lin. He's currently at the California Air Resource Board. Uh, Professor Karne, Sarita Karne was a former graduate student of mine at AM Kingsville, and she's now an assistant professor at Wilkes University and a long-term collaborator in air quality research studies. Uh, former students Maliha Maitin and Madhi Amadi. Uh, Dr. Amadi also did both his master's with me and a PhD in environmental philosophy at UNT. He's currently a data scientist at UNT. And last but not the least, Dr. Saikat Gos, whose work I presented to you all. Uh, he's an atmospheric scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Lab. And of course, funding agencies and supporting agencies. Thank you, and I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Professor Kurila. Maybe we'll just uh, all of I request all of you to start your camera. We'll have one uh, group photo. Saroop, are you able to see all the photos? Yes, sir. Uh, you are yet to start. Uh, so, uh, I have taken one. I just wait. Uh, yeah, you are getting away. Everybody's? Yes, sir, almost. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor Kurila. Maybe now it's open for uh, you know uh, some uh, discussion. Uh, Probably. Some uh, pointed out we are all focusing towards uh, only the particulates uh, pollutants, and uh, although then we are also trying to look at it, its chemical composition, and try to look at it which source is contributing. But the killer pollutant is uh, mostly with this hydrocarbons, uh, which are much more toxic, uh, and uh, we were not having much in info, you know, uh, informations. Uh, on, on this, uh, particularly as you rightly said, uh, somewhere in the where there are a lot of uh, oil explore, explorations are happening, and probably that could be the one reason. But I'm also noticing that uh, because now uh, in urban areas, many fuel stations are, you know, uh, uh, started. And uh, uh, so, do you have some, uh, you know, comments on how this kind of an activity can influence? Uh, particularly the ozone concentration and other uh, secondary air, air pollutants. It's a very good observation, uh, Professor Nagendra. So my comment to that is uh, set in a stage in two different ways. Uh, what I did not touch on this, uh, this talk was the influence on, particularly from a health impact standpoint. So those researchers who are in, in, uh, really in the domain of environmental health or uh, exposure assessment. Uh, there are wonderful tools and models out there that can help quantify the impact. The recent work uh, I may allude to work done from Stanford and from Harvard that looks at the proximity of these oil and gas industrial facilities and activities and uh, the effect on those uh, the proximate locations on uh, human health. And so there have been significant uh, human health 
assessment of exposure assessment studies done. And so coming back to your question in terms of the fueling stations, et cetera, in dense urban areas, we really need to worry about these urban areas uh, from both from the standpoint of human health exposure standpoint and also from a precursor uh, emission standpoint. So we really need to kind of peg it in those two contexts. Uh, I, I will probably make more comments on the ozone precursor area being that being my area of expertise. And I will, through this August body of CIFA, you all have probably much better reach on environmental and health exposure assessment folks who can work on those domain. Uh, from an ozone precursor standpoint, yes, these fueling stations do have significant influence. Uh, several years ago, we did a study in a rather small urban industrialized area uh, where we looked at the influence of uh, the gas stations or what we call gas stations in the US, which is nothing but petrol stations in India. And we looked at uh, the influence of uh, the volatile organic compounds and uh, what that adds to the burden on air quality. And we were, we were able to, despite the fact that the air, air shed was in attainment, we, the urban uh, domain was influenced by all of these fueling stations and somewhere between three to five parts per billion of ozone was contributed by just these fueling stations. So uh, you, looking at that approach, there are different ways of uh, mitigating these emissions. Uh, one is implementing control technologies uh, at those facilities, uh, moving these storage tanks to underground storage tanks, using fueling techniques that will allow for vapor recovery, so that way you're not releasing the vapor back into the atmosphere. Uh, you also have, in uh, terms of dispensing equipment, will have vapor recovery devices attached to that, so that will also recover the volatile organic compounds coming out of that. It also adds to the burden in terms of exposure because there's a lot of benzene and other types of BTEX compounds associated with these volatile organic compounds. So any types of vapor recovery will not only help with ozone levels or photochemical, the use of photochemical activities, uh, it will also uh, help with the human health side of the equation. And last but not the least, uh, they, they also were able to assess the influence of fueling times. You don't want to be fueling during the hottest part of the day. So we are able to do move the fueling time or at least encourage uh, citizens to participate through voluntary messaging systems to move the fueling to early morning hours or late night hours and not do it during the peak photochemical production pathways. And all those measures added to the reduction of ozone concentration. So we were able to assess that using modeling tools as an example. So a, a, a very good question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kula. So this is one question uh, from a researcher. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, a clear as relationship established between uh, VOCs and ozone. Uh, do you also look at it? Is there any rela similar relationship happens with, uh, you know, the VOC and particulate matter concentration and ozone? So that is there uh, such observations are made? So uh, that's a really... Uh... Good question, and that's an area that uh, everyone is looking into right now. Um, I'll start with that comment I made earlier in the presentation when I was showing you the abraded seed dust that was coated with pesticides and neonicotinoids, right? So if we are uh, using that as an example. Uh, if you want to think about it from the standpoint that us, uh, there's uh, hydrocarbon coating on these aerosols and urban aerosols containing uh, not just inert inorganic material, but those inorganic materials also has, uh, and its core will also have hydrocarbon coating on it. And people have measured these in these particles. And I do worry about its long-term in influence because as it, it penetrates into your lungs, you would be able to uh, be affected by the hydrocarbons that are coated on these particles. So that is one aspect of it from a human health perspective. The second aspect of it is more in terms of secondary organic aerosol formation. Particulate matter uh, is formed, but then during these photochemical production pathways, you do form secondary organic aerosols that can also increase the burden of P measured PM2.5 and P measured PM1s in the urban atmosphere. So we need, really need to think about photochemical production that can contribute to particulate production. There's a group of scientists who have done this work, uh, including John Seinfeld at Caltech, all the way to uh, researchers in North Carolina, uh, 
who are working in this domain, uh, looking at particulate matter and secondary organic aerosol in urban and regional atmospheres. And last but not the least, uh, I've always worried about the, the uh, which I started discussing the human health aspect of it, the uh, particles that are bound with, with uh, hydrocarbons are probably going to be a lot more uh, influential in terms of uh, being carcinogenics and mutagenic. And so we really need to worry about those long chain hydrocarbons or even complex aromatics that are on these particles. And that's something that we really don't have uh, rich data sets. And I think uh, I'm hoping that in uh, very dense urban areas or highly polluted urban environments, including ones in India, we should be able to do some uh, field studies to assess the uh, human health impact from these types of diverse chemicals that are found on particle or particle bound hydrocarbon uh, compounds. So those are some initial comments I have. I will confess I don't have such a strong expertise in these areas, uh, other than being dangerous uh, and reading lots of papers on this area. Thank you for showing. So I was just also looking at uh, from the you know the Asian countries, particularly the developing countries. So we have uh, uh, many uh, two wheelers. You know the, where uh, the fuel uh, uh, filling for this kind of a two wheelers is completely different than the four wheelers. So in such case, uh, there, there will be a lot of uh, you know emissions can be contributed uh, because the the amount of fueling is also very less, and as a result, uh, the the contribute the frequent fueling will also lead to you know more uh, you know evaporation of this uh, fuel. Uh, do you have any comments on uh, in terms of design? Because basically, I'm I'm sure that uh, particularly the four wheelers they have a very nice uh, design for the uh, well for fueling of the uh, uh, to the four wheelers. But I'm not seeing such a similar uh, design for the two wheelers. So do you have such comments? Uh, any comments on uh, how do we address this kind of an issue in in country like India? So I. I guess this is more a question for, I mean, the technology is there. It's not like it's not there. We can use the same vapor recovery devices at the dispensing units to deliver the fuel and the vapors are collected back. So the technology is there. It's just a question of modifying the tank or the modifying the uh, openings for the fuel delivery. But that said, uh, and, and so it's a question more to the uh, automotive manufacturers and what they can do. I mean, the technology is there in the Western countries that they, they can adapt very easily, and including in Japan. And I believe most of the two wheel manufacturers are doing uh, very coming up to speed with a lot of the EU standards and a lot of the US EPA standards. So that's a step in the right direction. What I worry more about is the uncontrolled emissions from these two wheel emissions from a combustion byproduct emissions, right? That's what I worry about. Because not all of those two wheelers have catalytic converters or not all of them have pollution control devices that will remove these pollutants. And so that is something of concern, a bigger concern to me than just the fuel dispense, dispensing and our fuel our vapor recovery from those uh, fuel tanks. So there's another question from uh, how do we estimate emissions from lake uh, and uh, underground energy sources? Particularly, well, that's a good question. Uh, and so uh, for, uh, let me address the underground uh, sources. Uh, the emissions are not necessarily uh, underground. Uh, the emissions are mainly coming at the point because remember we are talking about depths of four thousand feet and. To 8,000 feet, we're talking about significant depths of where these extraction is occurring. So the emissions are typically at the wellhead or at the compressor stations that are moving the fluids, or it is at the storage units that they would have on facility storage tanks. And so they would be venting of uh, volatile organic compounds into the atmosphere. So those are the primary emission sources that we worry about and not necessarily underground storage. However, that raises an interesting uh, issue. We also have lots of uh, underground uh, pipelines. In fact, I, I can show you a map that uh, the US Geological Survey and the state agencies have put together. The entire country is crisscrossed 
It's like a mesh or a web of underground pipelines that are moving uh, hydrocarbons and fluids from different production facilities from Canada to Mexico. And these pipelines are fairly old. They're about 50 to 160 years old. And these pipelines are starting to go through these corrosion damage. And so there are some concerns about uh, leaks, more so in the safety domain of these underground uh, pipelines. Uh, and then there are some above ground pipelines, which will have a bigger influence or outsized influence on the urban atmosphere or rural atmosphere. But it's a good, good question, a good comment. Uh, I don't know the question that about the lake. I was not sure or I didn't understand. So if you can restate that, I might be able to address that. So we basically during the uh, ranking, how the emissions are estimated from the lake system. Yeah, I think uh, it was a question from Sudhir, I believe. Or... Yeah, yeah, it's from Sudhir. Okay, maybe you can uh, send a, a you know private email to you yeah. and uh, get it clarified. Absolutely. If I can find out and if I can find information, I'll be happy to share. Uh, yeah, the other, other question, uh, yeah, other question uh, from another researcher is how can we control ozone levels uh, because ozone chemistry is a uh, complex and uh, uh, sometimes uh, you know uh, other uh, precursor can also uh, influence us in reduce. Hear me? Shiva, I apologize. I heard, yeah, I just, I did not hear all the I, questions. I, you know, I think Fine. there will be some, yeah, maybe I'll repeat it because this is uh, some issue with the net, uh, network okay. connection. Okay. So, uh, how can uh, ozone can be controlled? Uh, because uh, ozone is a very complex uh, chemistry and also the interaction between the precursor and the ozone, some titration happens. So so what is the kind of uh, technology we're suggesting uh, in order to address the ozone problem? Oh, this, is a, this is not a new issue. Uh, so this uh, ozone issue has been around since uh, the 1980s. Uh, in the early decades of the 80s and 90s, most of the ozone problems were in the West Coast, in California, in Los Angeles. Was the early from the 50s on they were dealing with ozone issues, and the smog chamber chemistry that was conducted at UC Riverside and other institutions in California led us to a better understanding of the ozone precursor emissions, which most of them tend to be either volatile organic compounds and oxides of nitrogen, and a lot of them are associated with combustion of fossil fuel or hydrocarbons. So that said, uh, the control of ozone. Uh, even though it's, it, you're, you correctly and rightfully pointed out that ozone formation in the lower troposphere is a very complex, uh, it is confounded by uh, both the conducive meteorology, it is confounded by the transport because ozone does get transported long distance. It's also confounded by very local, hyperlocal uh, for the chemical activities. But having said that, we can control ozone, and there has been proof in this uh, area, at least in the eastern United States and in, in California, where they have been able to go after major sources of uh, fossil fuel combustion, particularly that is releasing oxygen and nitrogen. So they went after coal fired plants, uh, power plants. So they uh, took the big, uh, the low hanging fruits of big. Fossil based combustion systems uh, like major point sources uh, in, uh, associated with power plants, electric generating units, uh, industrial facilities, and they start adding uh, regulatory mechanisms for controlling emissions by adding, requiring uh, emissions control devices for NOx control and also for volatile organic compound control. Uh, second, uh, then after that, they tackled. Uh, uh, mobile sources. So that's that was a bigger problem in LA, Los Angeles, because mobile sources was the dominant source of emissions and coupled with industrial facilities. So they went after that by going after capital converters. And so you saw this progression over the last three to four decades. 
of uh, emissions control, both in the major sources of emissions on the major point sources, uh, area sources, and uh, mobile sources of emissions. So I think there is a sufficient track record of air quality control from these point and area sources and mobile source uh, approaches. What I do worry about is these uh, unconventional sources that are not necessarily regulated. And that's what the, the early discussion today was looking at those that can contribute or uh, may could have significant influence on otherwise a decrease in ozone levels, at least you would so you start to see stubbornness in the ozone formation. Uh, and that said, uh, there is also uh, a, a ozone formation can also be very localized where you could have a major point sources and downwind of that point sources, you could have titration of ozone. And subsequently, you can have buildup of NOI compounds that is transported great distance, and several hundred miles away, you could have formed ozone within the plume. So you have demonstrated those types of formation in large plumes of uh, fossil-based combustion sources and stacks, and there have been aircraft measurements that have looked at those types of analysis. And I think there is approaches of controlling these both at the, removing the precursors such as NOx and hydrocarbons, or particularly volatile organic compounds. So we are going after reactive hydrocarbons. And now this research, we are now starting to worry about even the slow reactive hydrocarbons, that if there is a sufficient large pool, that can also tilt the balance in the ozone formation strategies. But yeah, there's a short answer is ozone uh, levels in certain parts of the world have declined or are declining in the urban atmospheres because of uh, rigorous controls of oxides and nitrogen and hydrocarbon emissions in these uh, major point sources and mobile source strategies. I hope that answered the question. Professor Nagetra, I think we are having connectivity issue here. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Now. Yes, so uh, the, the last uh, uh, question for the uh, today's talk discussion uh, is that now we have, we have seen that there is a lot of changes happened in terms of uh, uh, measurements, uh, particularly we initially looked measurement of uh, suspended particulate matter, then now, now we are PM10, PM2.5. Now, with, since this VOC and other uh, hydrocarbons are playing an important role, uh, are uh, uh, any uh, change in strategy in terms of measurement of a particular uh, you know, uh, uh, indicator pollutant, for example, uh, PM1 uh, or uh, number concentrations or uh, maybe uh, the other gaseous pollutants uh, that could be a kind of an indicator to uh, you know, health risk assessment? It's a, uh, it, it's a very loaded question, and I just want to clarify, I hope uh, you all heard the previous response. So it, it, this one kind of dovetails with that question that was raised. Uh, with regard to health risk assessment, uh, as a researcher, I would like to see all kinds of data. I would like to see all kinds of measurements. I think a uh, precursor to that uh, has been uh, explored here in the United States, which is uh, they develop super sites. So they would have super sites, which would be measurement sites in urban and rural areas, or which would be measuring all pollutants, criteria pollutants, uh, ozone, NOx, uh, PM1, PM2.5, PM10. Uh, they look at hydrocarbons. They will look at indicator species or speciated hydrocarbons. Uh, they be, they, uh, they'll do automated gas chromatographs. So they have super sites for particular matter uh, coupled with gaseous uh, measurements. And what these sites would also provide is a rich 
repository of rich data for behavior over time on characteristics of uh, in the atmosphere and the the chemistry within the atmosphere. So these super sites are a good starting point for doing these types of collective measurements. And I believe there are some efforts in India, if I'm not mistaken, leading towards some of these super site related types of measurement activities. Coupled with that, uh, we also need to understand the transport phenomena, the transport aspect of pollution. So there are measurements that are conducted using not only remotely sent satellite measurements, but also using uh, flight patterns and look, looking at even drone technology now for detecting uh, or measuring uh, in and around urban areas, but also measurement at or near super site facilities, which would allow for a complex measurements of all types of hydrocarbons. So it depends on the question that we are posing. It depends on the uh, studies that you want to conduct or the influence of emissions or you know, on health risks. So the questions will dictate the type of measurements that you one needs. So I may not have provided the answer. I may have given a non-answer to this, but I'm suggesting that it totally depends on the type of question that you're going to be asking. If it is a purely health risk assessment measurement, uh, measuring a PM10 may or may not necessarily address all of the questions, but on the other hand, looking at speciated hydrocarbons and looking at speciation of PM2.5 or PM1 that goes into your lung systems would be more meaningful for understanding the complexity from the impact on human health. So that's a, in a nutshell what I would say, depending on the problems that you're studying. Uh, Professor Kurila, thank you very much. And uh, in fact, it is a, a great, uh, you know, learning from uh, your uh, actual experience with the several case studies which you have involved, uh, particularly the, the very complex air pollution problems which you addressed in uh, Texas and Denton. Uh, on behalf of uh, SIPA Network, uh, we would like to thank you for uh, your uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, sparing your time. Uh, particularly in the late night. Uh, I, I'm sure that it's always close to <laughs> midnight now. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I also would like to thank uh, all the participants. Uh, without their participation, this kind of lecture will not be of much uh, success. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we would like to thank uh, our uh, uh, UKRE for supporting this uh, activities and uh, we are continuing to uh, you know, hold this lecture series every month. And uh, we wanted to expand this uh, to other uh, you know, uh, areas and maybe regulators. We wanted to bring them and uh, see that how we can learn. Uh, uh, again, I, I, yes, I, I'm sure that this is a, a network, some issues. Uh, yeah, thank you all uh, for uh, joining this uh, particular talk. And uh, Professor Kurgula, thank you very much. And we look forward to uh, uh, your visit to IIT Madras in the coming month. Absolutely. I just want to put a plug in there. Thank you, uh, Professor Nagendra, for hosting me and allowing me to give this talk. And uh, I will be visiting IIT Madras, uh, Professor Nagendra and his group. Uh, in this fall in October, and I look forward to uh, engagement. I'll be available in India, so would love to visit with each and every one of you if possible and look at possible uh, idea generation or collaboration. So look forward to seeing you all. Thank you again for hosting me, Shiva. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kurvila, and uh, good night. Good night. Take care. Good. Have a good day and have a great Earth Day. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, see you all. Have a good day. Bye bye.